disc brakes, drum brakes, ceramic brakes, six piston brakes, master cylinder, brake shoes. These are all terms you'll be confronted with when looking up brakes. Today we are going to explore how brakes work and take a look at the two main types of brakes. Let's get it started. When Nicolas Cugnot built his first car and crashed it into a wall shortly after, he quickly realized that a powerful engine driving a car was important, but having strong brakes which can stop the car were equally important. But for the first couple of years of automobile production, brakes were disregarded as the friction in the drive shaft was so high that it slowed down the car enough to where you didn't need brakes. But with more power and less friction in the drive shaft came the need for brakes. Some first prototypes were wooden blocks that pressed up against wheels themselves, but this proved rather inefficient, as you could imagine. That's why the idea was quickly replaced by drum brakes, the first brakes to actually make it into mass production. As I've just mentioned, the friction in the drive shaft was causing the cars to slow down. But as you could imagine, it also put a lot more work on the engine as it had to fight against said friction. So the idea for brakes was to keep the friction but to control the amount of friction and when it takes place. To achieve this we need one component spinning with the wheels and another component pressing up against the first one when pressing the brake pedal, thus creating friction and turning the rotational movement into heat. To achieve this movement the first brakes used a mechanical system of wires being pulled. But this system caused a lot of issues, like uneven brake power and snapping of cables. Thus it was overthrown by a hydraulic system, which fixed most of the issues. Let's move away from the theory and take a look at the most important parts of a brake drum. The first part is the backing plate. It, it doesn't move and acts as a base plate for all other components. It also absorbs the torque that is created through braking, that's why it's also called the torque plate. The next big component is the brake drum. This is the component rotating with the wheel, that's why it's mounted on top of the drive shaft. The brake shoes are the components pressing up against the so-called working surface of the drum. In a drum brake there are always two brake shoes, one leading shoe and one trailing shoe. The leading shoe is the shoe closest to the front of the vehicle and logically the trailing shoe is the other one. These brake shoes are made up of two components, the shoe itself and the brake lining material. The brake lining material is the thing actually being pressed against the working surface, therefore it wears down every time you brake. That's why brakes need to be maintained. For the brake shoes to move outward there's the wheel cylinder. The wheel cylinder houses two pistons, one for each shoe. These pistons are being forced outward by the brake fluid when you press the brake, causing the shoes to move as well. If you were to let off the brakes now, the shoes would stay in their place. That's what the return springs are for. They pull the shoes back into their starting position. As you can see, the whole braking system is enclosed by the backing plate and the brake drum. This has some advantages. The braking components themselves are not exposed to the risk of rust, which makes them more weather resistant. But it also causes some issues. Being a closed system, cooling the brakes is almost impossible. And keeping the brakes cool is crucial, as the brake drum starts to expand due to the heat. This means that you have to press the brake pedal further to achieve the same braking power as with cold brakes. The heat can also cause the brake fluid to vaporize, which further decreases braking power. All of this together is the reason you won't find a lot of drum brakes on modern cars, except for some smaller cars or entry level models, such as some smarts but even on some Ford Rangers, as drum brakes are a lot cheaper. But even on small cars you'll mainly find them on the rear axis as the main braking power is being output by the front axis due to the weight shift in the car when braking. If you ask yourself what brakes are on the front axis, the right answer is disc brakes. Instead of having a drum surface, the working surface and the shoes pressing outward, with disc brakes you have a disc or also called a brake roller, which is being clamped down from both the sides. This design has two major advantages. You can generate more force and therefore more braking power when squeezing down instead of pressing outwards. And the surface area of the brake disc is bigger so the heat can dissipate a lot faster. 
Once again, let's take a look at the most important components. Let's start off with the brake disc itself. The disc is now the part spinning with the wheel. That's why it's once again mounted onto the drive shaft. The first and nowadays cheapest brake discs are so called solid discs. As the name suggests, they are just a solid piece of metal. If you want to increase cooling power, you need to increase the surface area. This is achieved by cutting small channels into the rotor, which let air through the brake disc, helping to dissipate the heat a lot faster. Another way to increase the surface area and therefore the cooling is to cut slots or even holes into the working surface of the disc brake. This design has another advantage. It wears down the brake pads a lot faster, causing the brake power to increase. But as you might imagine, it also increases the maintenance interval, which is why you'll mainly find these kinds of brakes on sports and race cars. Now, as I've mentioned, we need something clamping the disc down, similar to the brake shoes, but here it is called brake pads. Once again, brake pads are made up of two different materials, one providing the base and one actually being worn down. To clamp these brake pads down, they are so-called calipers. There are two main types of caliper the floating caliper and the solid or post piston caliper. First, let's talk about the floating caliper, as it is most common in today's cars. The floating caliper houses one piston, which pushes the first brake pad against the rotor. Once the brake pad makes full contact with the working surface, the piston moves further, causing the whole caliper to be pulled towards the car, allowing the second brake pad to make contact with the rotor therefore clamping it down. This free movement is why this type of caliper is called the floating caliper. With the solid caliper on the other hand, we have two or more pistons facing each other, clamping down the brake pads onto the brake rotor. After understanding both types of caliper, we can talk about the difference in them. The ability to move in one direction makes the floating caliper more tolerant for imperfections in the disc, but also causes them to get stuck sometimes due to corrosion. The floating caliper also houses one or at max two pistons, limiting its brake power. If you want more brake power, going with a solid caliper is a much better approach, as it saves a lot of space, because you have double the piston in the same space as with floating calipers. That's why you find solid calipers on cars which are either powerful or heavy, in some cases both. Solid calipers are also less vulnerable to rust, but they are also more expensive, which is another reason most manufacturers won't use them unless it's necessary. 